Welcome to our Sunday service. My name is Lori Mickelson and I pastor the Northern Lights Christian Fellowship Church of the Nazarene here in Chetwin. Let's open with prayer. O oh Lord, we live in a world that really needs you, but so many don't know that. We live in a day where there is so much hardship and difficulties going on and it's easy to get lost in the shuffle. We have seen some of the ways you have encouraged us through discouraging times throughout this year and we are grateful. Thank you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we may not fall or lose our footing along the way. Fill us with your Spirit and open our eyes and our hearts so that we can constantly have our eyes on you so we do not waver. Thank you, Lord. Amen. How is everyone doing today? How have you weathered the past year and a half? How has your family weathered this season? I can tell you for sure that this has not been an easy or a comfortable time and there is a lot of uncertainty in the hearts of many. Don't be discouraged, hang in there. Don't lose heart and certainly don't stop looking for God's hand in the people and the events that surround you. That is the quickest way to get lost along the way. Don't watch too much news and don't lose your focus. One foot in front of the other and always looking up. There is not any one of us in this place who has not lost their way somewhere along the road. This applies to our Christian walk as well. There have been times and seasons of doubt of God's power, doubt of God's goodness, doubt of God's care. We ask questions, why is this happening to me? God, are you hearing me? God, this is way too much for me to handle. David felt that way very often. Apparently, so did Asaph. Psalm 73 is a psalm written by Asaph. Asaph was the leader of one of David's Levitical choirs. So Asaph knew God. Asaph knew God's word and he knew God's promises. But just listen to the first couple of verses of this psalm. Psalm 73, verse 1 and 2. Truly God is good to Israel, to those whose hearts are pure. But as for me, I almost lost my footing. My feet were slipping and I was almost gone. The first thing that Asaph does is to recognize that he's almost lost his footing. He sees that he's falling deeper and deeper. And then he goes into details. Verses 3 to 14. For I envied the proud when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. They seem to live such painless lives. Their bodies are so healthy and strong. They don't have troubles like other people. They're not plagued with problems like everybody else. They wear pride like a jeweled necklace and clothe themselves with cruelty. These fat cats have everything their hearts could ever wish for. They scoff and speak only evil. In their pride, they seek to crush others. They boast against the very heavens and their words strut throughout the earth. And so the people are dismayed and confused, drinking in all their words. What does God know, they ask? Does the Most High even know what's happening? Look at these wicked people, enjoying a life of ease while their riches multiply. Did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. We can see how easy it is to get sidetracked and lose our footing. He envied those who were proud. They didn't seem to have the difficulties surviving and were doing quite well in the process. They were strong, they were healthy, and by all appearances, they didn't have any problems. At least, not problems like others had. Yet they were cruel and they flaunted it. They had everything they could possibly want and they gloated and bragged about it. Take a really close look at, chap at verse 10. And so the people are dismayed and confused, drinking in all their words. What does God know, they ask? Does the Most High even know what's happening? Look at these wicked people, enjoying a life of ease while their riches multiply. But things are not always what they seem. We have to remember that. That's another part of the story. There are two strong themes in these verses. Number one, the wicked prosper, leaving the godly people wondering why they bother to be good. 
If we have been one of those fortunate few who have weathered more than a few storms in life and survived spiritually, then we know why we bother being good. You see, we know the end of the story. We know there is hope for eternity. We know that no matter what may assail us, that God is with us and provides us with the strength to hang on by the fingertips and thank Him for the fingertips. King David knew that. Boy, did he know that. David didn't deny that he had his moments of weakness or that he didn't understand what God was doing. He admitted it, and as we've seen in the Psalms that we've already studied, he then focused on the goodness of God, the protection of God, the love of God, and the power of God. And he thanked God for being who he was and all that he had done. When he sinned, he repented and asked God to cleanse his heart and create in him a clean heart to worship God forever. It's interesting to see that even though the Savior had not yet come, David knew that there was an eternity. He knew that all things were happening were only for a season. Well, we all know that some seasons are a whole lot longer than others. Asaph began this psalm the same way. He didn't sugarcoat how he was feeling. He confessed his weaknesses. He confessed that he had almost lost his footing. He was hanging over the edge. Number two. The wealth of the wicked looks so inviting that faithful people may wish that they could trade places. We have to be careful how we respond to circumstances. If we look only at circumstances and the people involved, it would be so easy to lose our way. It would be a temptation to stop trying. But we have to remember once again, things are not what they seem. Yes, the wicked may prosper for a while. Yes, they may be appear to be living the perfect life for a while, but just listen to the next two verses, verses 15 and 16. If I had really spoken this way to others, I would have been a traitor to your people. So I try to understand why the wicked prosper, but what a difficult task that is. Asaph was a choir leader. The Levites were responsible for the religious leadership of the Jews in the temple. He knew the responsibility of his position. That's why he said, if I had spoken this way to others, I would have been a traitor to your people. He was supposed to be grounded. He was supposed to be faithful. He was a leader and shouldn't have feelings like this. So what did he do? He made every effort to understand why the wicked prosper. He admitted it was almost an impossible task. As believers, we are all part of the priesthood. As believers, we can experience some of those same thoughts that Asaph had. However, we can be honest with God. He knows how we feel anyway, so there's no sense in lying about it. It's tough. But remember, we've read the last chapter of the book. We know how it ends. Asaph didn't have this book. He had the first chapters, but he didn't have the book of Revelation. Psalm 73, 17 to 20. Then I went into your sanctuary, O God, and I finally understood the destiny of the wicked. Truly, you put them on a slippery path and sent them sliding over the cliff of destruction. In an instant, they're destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. When you arise, O Lord, you will laugh at their silly ideas as a person laughs at dreams in the morning. And then Asaph went to meet with God in his sanctuary, and everything changed. He asked God a couple of questions. Why do the wicked prosper? Did he keep his own heart pure for nothing? He admitted, I don't get it. I don't understand. And as he stood there in the sanctuary, as he stood there before God himself, God met him in an incredible way, and he finally got it. God showed him his justice. God showed him the destination of the wicked. The wicked can't take their wealth with them when they die, so all that wealth loses its power. The rewards for the godly take on an eternal value. What used to be so important in life is now a waste, and what seemed to be worthless now lasts forever. In verse 20, Asaph realized that the rich, wicked live in a dream world. Our life's goals are important, but once again we're reminded of Matthew 6, 19 to 21. 
Don't store up treasures here on earth, where moths eat them and rust destroys them, where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven, where moths and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desire of your heart will be also. <laughs> Happiness and hope can be a reality, but only when they're based on God and not on riches. Verses 21 to 27. Then I realized that my heart was bitter and I was all torn up inside. I was so foolish and ignorant. I must have seemed like a senseless animal to you, yet I still belong to you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, leading me to a glorious destiny. Whom have I on, in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. My health may fail and my spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. Those who desert him will perish, for you destroy those who abandon you. When Asaph saw God's justice, when he realized that God heard him and answered his cry for understanding, he realized that his heart had been bitter. It's far too easy to become bitter when things don't turn out the way we expect. But we must remember that God's justice is a pure justice, that God's love is a pure love, and that we don't know all of any given situation in our lives. As Asaph recognizes just how ignorant he was, Yet all through this process, he also recognized that he still belonged to God. God still guided him. God still had his hand on him, and he rested in those promises. He committed himself to continue to follow God and do the task that he was assigned to do, sing God's praises. And being the proper Levitical choir leader that he was, he gave thanks. Psalm 73, verse 28. But as for me, how good it is to be near God. I have made the Sovereign Lord my shelter, and I will tell everyone about the wonderful things you do. And he rested. He rested in the knowledge that it was good to be near God. It was good to trust God, and he committed himself to telling everyone about the good things God did. Once again, we see a pattern that's in the Psalms a pattern of admit, admitting the distress that we may feel, the confusion that may overtake us at some of the things that the world throws at us. Once again, we see the psalm writer not holding anything back. He calls it like he sees it. But once again, we see God meeting with the psalm writer and giving him a new understanding of the situation. We see the transformation from worry to worship. And we see by the end of the psalm, a psalm writer who is stronger, more dedicated, and full of worship for the mighty God we serve. Maybe, just maybe, we should all try to be psalm writers. They don't have to be fancy words. They just need the honesty of our heart and the listening to his response. Listening and hearing. There's a bit of a difference between the two. Listening just means that you're listening. But hearing means that you've listened and now you're responding in obedience. And then we add our praise for his abounding grace into the words of thanksgiving. How hard can it really be? We must be careful how we answer that. We could be surprised. And always keep your minds on the word, words from Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Now all glory to God, who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior through Christ Jesus our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time and in the presence and beyond all time. Amen. Amen.